Hello, everybody. This is Chris Sturgis, and I am del delighted to welcome you to today's Competency Works webinar on how state educational leaders are advancing competency education. We will be exploring how state policy is being developed, and we are joined by Susan Patrick of iNicole, Jason Glass, Director of the um, Iowa Department of Education, and Don Savisky, Superintendent of Instruction, Maine Department of Education. Thank you all, Susan, John, Jason, and Don, for joining us. Before we start, I'd like to provide a little background for those of you who are totally new to Competency Works. Competency Works is a project of the International Association for K-12 Online Learning. INICOL is a nonprofit organization with over 4,000 members focused on student-centered new learning models using online and blended learning that are competency-based. INICOL's number one policy priority is moving away from seat time to competency education supporting policies and practices that provide more effective learning for students. iNicole is the lead partner on Competency Works, and our other partners are the American Youth Policy Forum, National Governors Association, and Jobs for the Future. And we have an absolutely terrific advisory board that you can find on the um, Competency Works website. We'd also like to take this opportunity to recognize the leadership of the Nellie May Education Foundation. We are certainly very uh, thankful for all the contributions we get from foundations, but we have to just take this moment. We always say this. Nellie May has been an outstanding partner, um, very creative. They're willing to take risks, um, and they, they are just um, thought partners as well as being able um, to in make these kinds of investments. So thank you. So quickly, a little bit about Competency Works. Hopefully, you've all been on the page. We're dedicated to creating a virtual learning space for those of you advancing competency education across the country. As you probably know, you can find blog posts written by students, teachers, principals, consultants, and state leaders sharing what they're learning. We periodically write briefing papers on topics that are of high interest. And we offer the Competency-Based path path Pathways Wiki so that you can find additional resources when you need them. This webinar will be archived and resources can be found at the wiki. In fact, you may want to create a tab right now so that you can take a look during the webinar. You can find the link to the wiki up here. Um, and if you click on that, it will take you to the wiki and then scroll down the left-hand side and you can find the state policy resources. During this webinar, we highly encourage you to use the chat room. We don't use our mics. Um, we use the chat room. Um, we have found that this is a really important part of our conversation. You all getting to know each other is equally as important as learning from Jason and Don and Susan today. So please introduce yourself if you haven't, say where you're from and what your background is. And also ask any questions or comments in the chat room and refer people to other resources. When we have time during the question and answer, Susan and I will pull out the questions and ask our presenters. Um, okay, now. Just, there's a few folks who are always new to competency education, so we always want to take this moment to reorient ourselves around the definition of competency education. States and schools are using different language, and in fact, Don will use langu the language of proficiency-based, whereas Jason's going to use the language of competency-based, and we think that's actually fine, but what we think is very important is that we have a shared definition. In front of you is the one that we um, developed with input from the innovators in the field, Regardless of what we call it, what, we, what is most important is that we share this commitment to helping students reach proficiency with adequate supports and time. In the current system, we're allowing some students to progress without the skills they need, and others are held back. This definition is designed to drive towards quality and equity. Each of the um, elements are important. We continue to test ourselves, and we find that all five elements are absolutely critically important. If you have any questions about the definition, please ask them in the chat room, and um, either one of the other participants or Susan and I will try to answer them. Now, I'd like to quickly introduce our panelists. Susan P Patrick is the President and CEO of the International Association for K-12 Online Learning. Jason Glass as, um, is the Education Director from Iowa. And Don Savisky, who is not a bird, that is the state bird of the black-capped chickadee, uh, State Bird of Maine is the superintendent for instruction, um, and Don has previously been a teacher, principal, and superintendent, and he's very proud of his three adult children, five grandchildren, and married 40 years to a saint. <laughs> so you can get a sense of who Don is from that little short bio. 
So now what I'm going to do is inter um, turn this over to Susan. Thank you, Chris. This is Susan Patrick, and I will begin by providing an overview of the new paper that is focused on state policy, a guide to competency education. Um, the paper was launched at a CCSSO Innovation Lab Network meeting, and I just want to give special thanks to the entire CC CCSSO team and the Innovation Lab Network uh, the leading states, districts, and schools that are involved in really redesigning next generation learning around competency-based education. Uh, in the CCSSO Innovation Lab Network, we have the leading states in competency education, including uh, today's presenters in Iowa and Maine, um, and a number of you that are participating in this webinar. So many thanks to you. Um, the new paper that was released on state policy is really meant to amplify the great work happening in states and on the ground in competency-based education. This paper is really meant to point out the highlights around state policy and a number of interviews were conducted with state leaders in the field. This is meant to be a tool for the field to help support you. The new paper on state policy starts by explaining why the time-based traditional system is holding our students back. It provides interviews with state leadership, many quotes, to help clarify the concepts of competency education, the strategies that states are taking in engaging in competency-based learning, and the strategies are different around different states. So I think it's important for states to understand that in their different contexts, there may be different drivers and different reasons. Uh, the paper notes the implementation steps that are taken by a variety of states to introduce moving from seat time and policy to competency-based learning. It highlights some of the lessons learned and acknowledges the changing emerging policy infrastructure as well as what is needed for full alignment with mastery-based learning on the ground. So this alignment between what happens with practitioners in schools and classrooms to the district, to the state, to even the federal level as we run into policy around accountability and assessment um, is a key piece highlighting the work across the field. The last piece um, in the interviews with state leadership is really around creating a culture supporting competency-based student-centered learning within the state education agencies. Um, and this extends to the communication and outreach across the field in building the support for systemic change and uh, second order change management. So we'll go ahead and move to the next slide. We want to drive a policy um, towards more student-centered, high-quality competency-based models. And so the policy framework that's laid out in the paper to support both competency education and next-generation learning is, number one, first and foremost, policy should be made to support the needs of students. This policy, in, in all across the United States, is being driven even in a different context by improving student learning and outcomes. Key policy frameworks also include guarding high academic standards and levels of rigor, helping to support and expand student options and how they navigate their pathways through K-12 education to be ready for life, careers, and college. It's about creating shared vision, and I think this piece is, is really important in communicating and engaging the community to create a shared vision, not just in schools, at the policy levels, at the state or district level, but on the ground in communities so that students, families, parents, teachers, uh, the school board members and the leaders all the way up to the highest level of leadership at the state and the federal level, this creating a shared vision and community engagement is really critical, and we're going to walk through some specific examples of this today. 
Another key policy framework for driving competency-based learning is about offering districts and schools the flexibility that they need to create innovations for students. And last, but certainly not least, is a commitment to continuous improvement. As more and more data is available down to the level of standards and competencies on what students are proficient in, what they need help in, how to create supports not only for students but for educators, it creates a cycle of continuous improvement across the state. And the state education agencies and state policymakers in having this policy framework can address all of these areas to ensure high quality, competency-based, student-centered learning. So last but not least, um, and I'm just touching on what the paper uh, covers, we encourage you to go online to competencyworks.org and download the paper and use it as a tool in your state. But we recognize that we're taking a snapshot of different approaches that are happening in states. So Think about what the issues are that you're considering in your state as you move from a traditional one-size-fits-all uh, factory model in schooling to a personalized competency-based learning system that's really designed around supporting students and allowing them to uh, reach their full potential as they go through um, maybe a very personalized pathway. So in these approaches, um, we outline five general approaches in states and districts looking at redesign around student-centered learning, uh, focusing on how they address the areas of what we call non-consumption from disruptive innovation theory. For example, 40% of our high schools in the U.S. don't offer advanced placement classes to students. In California, 40% of high schools don't offer the A to G requirements to even apply the University of California state system of colleges and universities. So students need access perhaps to online courses. These areas of non-consumption can be improved by offering new opportunities, although seat time is often a huge barrier. So moving to competency pathways where we can address redesign areas of non-consumption. Uh, third area, we see states setting up innovation zones in Colorado and New York uh, to build competency education systems. For credit flexibility and waivers, moving to a competency-based system is key, and also gateways for multiple pathways, including internships, after-school programs, and other gateway opportunity for students. And with that, we created a map that is right now a snapshot of competency education policy across the U.S. And we're going to hear today from two states that are leading this bold vision around the future of education, next generation learning, competency-based education. I want to thank our speakers today and turn it over to Jason Glass, who's the director, state chief, of the Iowa Department of Education. Uh, thank you, Jason, for your bold leadership there, and I will turn it over to you. Well, hi, Susan, and uh, thanks, I may call, and thanks, Don, uh, for everyone for putting this together. I'm uh, uh, thrilled to get to participate. I um, appreciate how generous you guys are in calling us an advanced state. I'm not quite sure it's accurate, but uh, uh, we'll take any accolades that we can um, uh, garner at this point. Uh, I would start off by saying that um, uh, this is a process of learning, uh, and there is uh, a, a great deal of work to be done around defining what competency-based education is and what it is not. Uh, and how we operationalize it or turn it into something that can be um, uh, easily put into place in uh, schools. So I um, appreciate the uh, labeling of being an advanced state, but uh, I think that the, the more accurate label for us is a learning state, as I think uh, several, several of us are. Um, I'll give an overview of um, uh, how this uh, effort has rolled out in Iowa. Um, the State Board of Education in our state adopted uh, the advancement of competency-based education as a goal in the late 2000s. So that's, uh, I give that, our State Board a great deal of credit for um, moving this agenda forward. And um, I also credit 
the state board in Iowa uh, for working very hard to stay sort of politically neutral. Uh, they are uh, political appointees. They're appointed by governors uh, on terms. And the uh, majority of the state board we have now was appointed by um, uh, two Democratic governors, and we have a Republican governor now who has appointed uh, uh, new members, uh, a few new members to that board. But it's a, it's a bipartisan group, and they work very hard to make sure that they're not seen as a, a political entity or an animal of either party, but rather uh, an entity that is working uh, to advance things that are in the best interest of students. And so I, I think that their adoption of competency-based education as a goal um, uh, really helped move this forward because it gave it gave the efforts some credibility and it wasn't seen as coming from the left or the right or from one party or the other. Um, the reasons that the State Board was very interested in uh, advancing competency-based education were, um, I think, the recognition that um, uh, practically all of us have, that we have a lot of students that are bored, that are not challenged, uh, that are taking courses that they're not very interested in, uh, and that aren't very applic uh, applicable to uh, their lives now or their, where their lives are headed. Um, and we uh, are sort of warehousing kids in a system, uh, forcing them um, uh, to stay in uh, uh, through seat time to earn credit for things that they have already mastered or can demonstrate um, uh, mastery in. So um, uh, those things around trying to improve student engagement, trying to improve experiential learning where we have students that are getting out into communities more, taking advantage of um, uh, uh, learning opportunities that are abundant in our uh, communities uh, where we may not have the expertise inside the school walls. We have a great deal of expertise around uh, any number of uh, things that kids may be really interested in in our community. Um, and it also uh, Competency-based education contributes to uh, what we call the universal constructs in the Iowa Core. And the, the Iowa Core are our set of standards, and they're um, uh, based on sort of core academic standards. But they also include these universal constructs, which we sort of look to the future and think that these um, uh, these are going to increasingly become more and more important uh, as uh, uh, time progresses, uh, certainly content areas of math and science and reading and uh, social uh, studies are going to continue to be important, but uh, in the era of Google and instant information, we think these universal constructs are going to continue to rise in importance. Uh, so um, the State Board acknowledged that and felt that competency-based education was, was a method by which we could advance uh, work around these uh, universal constructs. So uh, some recent action, things that have happened uh, recently, and um, uh, I'll give some credit to uh, Susan Patrick and Ina Call, who helped us organize a statewide conference around this in uh, 2012, that uh, it sold out faster than a U2 concert. I think it took us less than 24 hours to have the thing completely filled up, and so it was incredibly exciting, and uh, Susan facilitated that for us, and we had um, a number of speakers from around the country who uh, came in to talk about um, this exciting initiative. Um, but that led to uh, the legislature in the last legislative session um, eliminating the requirement of seat time uh, for the uh, it, for schools to award credit. So it, it opened the pathway where schools could determine what competency meant locally, and then they had the authority to award uh, credit uh, based on competency. So there were no requirements around seat time, and that, that wasn't the case uh, previously. They also established a statewide standing task force. Um, and, um, uh, that task force continues to meet on a regular basis to work through some of the technical details around what competency-based education is and how it could be uh, expanded and spread. Uh, and they, they continue to report back to the uh, legislature uh, uh, every uh, around every six months uh, just to update the legislature on their progress and, and uh, inform the legislature on ideas where uh, the legislature could appropriate funds or clear things out of the way. Uh, to be uh, supportive of this effort. Uh, and my staff at the Iowa Department of Education, notably the uh, wonderful and talented Sandra Dopp, uh, uh, handles that for us. The uh, current work that we have going on around uh, competency-based education um, uh, is that we have about a, do a dozen districts from around the state experimenting with some form of this. Uh, and I say some form of this because we are struggling to define what is the difference between a, a competency versus a standard versus um, an outcome uh, uh, versus college and career readiness. I mean, all of these things swirl together. Uh, and, and we're trying to outline and highlight you know, what, what these things mean. 
and and also put together a sort of a handbook or a uh, um, a toolkit uh, for practitioners in schools uh, that they can go through um, and figure out what competency-based education means and and how to get it started in their schools. So that's the work that the task force is doing, and uh, we have about a dozen districts in the state that are um, experimenting with forms of that. Uh, we have several standout districts that have taken the lead, and I'm very proud of them. And we work to protect them uh, from. Uh, from reactionary movements uh, within education, sort of um, a, a thing that I think all innovators experience is that when a new idea pops up or when, when you're the crab that starts to cr try and crawl out of the bucket, everybody tries to pull you back down. And I think competency-based education is feeling some of that. So we have to work very hard to try and protect this new innovation from the forces of the status quo. Um, uh, so some of the ways that we've done that is by partnering with uh, state and national organizations who are also very interested in this. Uh, one element of that is the uh, CCSSO Innovation Lab Network, uh, which has competency-based education as a component of um, uh, what that uh, uh, collaborative of states are trying to accomplish. Uh, and the ASCD group in the state, the Iowa ASCD, is extremely supportive of competency-based education and is actually uh, conducting a um, uh, conference this summer to help advance this work. So we're relying on those partnerships. Um, the competency-based task force is also doing a scan of activity in the state um, to, and, and determine uh, what level of readiness exists. And we're uh, doing that in collaboration with our regional um, education laboratory, REL Midwest. Uh, so they been, been very generous to come to us and say, how can we help advance this effort? And what we've said is it would be great just to know uh, how many districts we have that are really doing some form of this and how many of them are already are on the verge of doing it. Uh, so uh, we're working with them uh, on, on those efforts. And then the other, the other components uh, around the uh, uh, definitions, the toolkit, the expansion strategy, the evaluation uh, are all things that the, that the task force is working on. The, the last part there, the evaluation and the evidence of effectiveness, is something that I've really charged this task force with. Um, there is a strong urge to sort of jump to this as the innovation that's going to save us all uh, from uh, having boring schools. Uh, and I've really pressured this group to say, um, uh, folks, we need some evidence that this is more effective than the, than the existing model before we sort of take a flying leap toward it. Um, and uh, that's uh, been greeted with some tears and resistance. But uh, I think it's so important that we have strong evidence, and, and broader than just test scores. So I'm not uh, restricting the evidence to just that. But it's, it's so important that we have some evidence that the outcomes for kids are better as a result of this. And, and uh, this group has uh, stepped up and um, uh, has taken that on. Uh, the legislature is um, uh, looking at putting in place a possible million dollars to help support this. And we have a coalition of the willing in the state so we're, uh, that are uh, adopting this. So there's no state mandate or pressure to have districts do it. Uh, some challenges uh, that we have um, that I think any, any state that uh, tries to walk down this path is probably going to experience some very similar um, challenges. Uh, well, first of all, it's, I think it's a poorly understood or misunderstood concept. Um, and uh, uh, just the, the notion of uh, uh, competency-based education, a lot of people scratch their heads and wonder what that is. And it takes us some time to orient people to what we're trying to accomplish. We also have some uh, districts and some schools in the state that are uh, competency-based in name only. Uh, so they say that they're doing competency-based, but when we actually visit them and see what they're doing, it's a very traditional model with uh, some uh, competency-based elements that are uh, in place. Um, a challenge is that I see that two um, parties in the state trying to say that they're the one that is the champion of competency-based education and the other group is the barrier. That's not healthy uh, to advance this effort. Uh, uh, everybody wants uh, more engaged students and wants uh, students who are uh, uh, more active in, in the uh, uh, decisions about their learning. So uh, we've tried hard to sort of uh, get this to be what's right for kids and less so for a political advantage. Um, some of the advocates for competency-based education, and I'll tie uh, this one in with the last bullet as well, is trying to walk before, trying to run before we can walk 
mentality or an all or nothing mentality. And what I mean by that is uh, they have a strong preference for the, they, they like to see the state just mandate this. Everybody has to do competency based education. And we've been clear to say, uh, slow down. Um, it's important that we know what this is. We can describe it to people and we have a procedure to put it in place before we uh, put it in place some kind of mandate to say you have to do it. Um, we also see it being used as the next silver bullet. Um, so you know, there's still a lot of learning about this innovation and how it, how it can be done and how it works that needs to be put in place. Um, and um, so improving education is a complicated endeavor that involves a lot of moving parts. And this is a really important innovation, but it, I think it, it can uh, uh, be seen as a silver bullet that we run to. Um, uh, now the, the last uh, challenge that I think we have is this misuse of the concept to avoid other requirements. And um, we have a, a whole host of uh, requirements, accreditation requirements that, that um, uh, school districts have to follow. <laughs> excuse me, have to follow to operate. Um, and we see some of some districts say, "Well, um, uh, I, I would like to be waived from uh, any number of these because I'm a, we're using a competency-based approach." Uh, well, it doesn't waive you out of things like licensure. It doesn't waive you um, out of things like making sure that you have a safe uh, school environment, that you're uh, running background checks on your employees. Uh, so uh, we have seen, in some cases, some misuse of this. But uh, I, I would say those are very isolated. And for the most part, the um, folks that are advancing competency-based education are doing it for the right reasons and in the right way. Uh, with that, I'll uh, stop. And if there are any questions for me, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, I look forward to hearing what Don has to say. And I will just, uh, again, express my appreciation for Susan and um, uh, I Nakel for organizing this. Thanks, guys. Jason, well, this is Chris. While we're waiting to see if there's any questions, I have one. You mentioned reactionary um, forces, I think you said, but re uh, different types of reactions to competency education that the innovators need protection from. Could you share what some of the larger concerns are and where they're coming from in the sense of the stakeholders or interests? Sure. Well, we're very used to school sort of looking and feeling a certain way. So especially if we think about like high school, for example. Uh, you know, the kids are there for four years. They're in school from 8.30 to 3.30 every day. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we start talking about a competency-based approach that, you know, if kids can demonstrate mastery, they can move forward more quickly. <coughs> Sorry. Excuse me. Um, it, 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 it generates a lot of questions about you know what happens when we have a bunch of students that are learning out in the community or that are uh, moving ahead and taking community college classes or doing internships um, uh, with uh, experts that are that are in the community and so you know where we have programs that have relied on uh, programs and uh, uh, classes that have relied on kids sort of being stuck in the high school and have to be warehoused somewhere. Now the kids are scattered everywhere, and so that, that's threatening to some folks. You know, what, what happens? Um, what happens to prom? What happens to the band? What happens to the football team before graduating kids out early because they can show that they've mastered uh, their requirements? Uh, so you know, it, it really challenges our vision of what school is, and, and um, uh, in some ways, it is, it is hard for some to accept. And so that's what I mean by the sort of reactionary forces against us. Great, thank you. And so we have a question that may be a little difficult for you to answer from your perspective, but I think it, it does raise a lot of questions. Merlin's asked, if leadership isn't coming from the state, is the district foolish to try some version of this? And so as you've watched the innovators in Iowa move forward, where are the places that they've bumped up against other state policy that really became problematic um, or that really needed state intervention to create some more innovation space? Well, um, I think uh, directly to uh, the question that was raised, um, I, I would encourage a, a uh, school leader in a district who wants to experiment with forms of this, you should absolutely you know, push against the state system uh, to uh, uh, try and uh, innovate in some ways and, and, and experiment with it. And you may have to find you know, someone working at the uh, State Department of Education who's willing to 
to have your back, who's willing to provide some cover, and willing to be flexible in thinking about what uh, uh, award, uh, awarding of credit looks like, uh, what the supervision of instruction looks like. I mean, these these concepts are different in a competency-based uh, approach. So I, I don't think um, that um, it, it's necessary in every case to have the leadership coming from the state. I think in, in, the, in the case of competency-based education in my state, the leadership is really coming from the districts. And I see it as my role to protect those innovative districts from the reactionary forces, um, uh, from uh, uh, sort of uh, rule follower, fact checker types that um, you know this looks a little different, feels a little different, and therefore it, it can't be allowed. Um, and to uh, uh, try and protect it from um, uh, you know some some of the more overzealous advocates of it who are trying to make it do something that it's just not ready to do yet. So um, I, I see the role, my role as a state leader in this is to try and set an environment where this can be successful. Wonderful. And last question. Um, could you talk about what reaction and your level of engagement around higher education, their reactions, um, and any issues that it might have been coming up with your higher education partners in Iowa? Um, I'd say that um, our institutions in higher education have um, uh, have a level of interest in this, particularly among some faculty members, but we we haven't seen. Um, uh, a great deal of uh, changes in teacher education programs or coursework available around what competency-based education is. Uh, I just haven't seen that that come from our institutions of higher education in the state. Um, this, uh, at least for for the state of Iowa, seems to be an innovation that is being driven by um, uh, K-12 practitioners, uh, and particularly some some uh, uh, um, K-12 practitioners who are. are uh, just acutely aware that we have a lot of students who are disengaged, who are bored, uh, that the current system is not working for, and they're the ones pushing the agenda. Uh, so uh, I expect this, this sort of continues to gain steam. We'll have some more interest from uh, from the institutions of higher education in it. But for, for right now, I think it's an effort being uh, led for the most part by practitioners in the field. Great. Thank you so much, Jason. We may have a few more questions at the very end. But at this point, we are now going to turn it over to Don Savisky from Maine, um, who I have to say hosted me for two days in Maine. And Susan's been there. And um, this is just a wonderful opportunity for all of us to hear from Don directly. Don, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to try to go back to the first slide. Uh, this is the beginning of a presentation that I've done probably 100 times in various districts across the state. And it, it forms the history of why we're even talking about this this, this topic. Um, Maine established a task force maybe five years ago to take a look at standards-based education, and it has quickly, and I say quickly, changed to learner-centered education because if you just adopt standards-based education, you are inflicting more pain and angst upon kids rather than helping them achieve. So the culture of the school is what we're talking about, and it's learning to be the constant in time, the variable. And at the bottom of the first slide, it's my prompt to uh, my audience is that learning is not a competitive event. It's a rite of passage. The GPA is probably very competitive, but the actual act of learning should be a rite of passage of every child. Um, the history in Maine is that um, many of the superintendents who attend the Harvard Graduate School uh, Summer Institute. And in 1998, I learned from Dick Elmore about standards-based education and, and moving towards learner centered. So I have been at this for 15 years. And if perseverance is the key to success, um, it really is. Uh, when the commissioner came on board a couple of years ago, he did a listening tour across the state and heard from superintendents and publics and kids and parents that uh, we had lurched for the last 20 years to try to fix a system that really was delivering the results of 1892. And in 1892, the curriculum was uh, subject to um, not change. And everyone had to go through the process of something that was unable to change. 
in this world, in our 2013 world, we're looking at how can we find multiple pathways and how can we activate students' uh, involvement. I remember in Good to Great, Jim Collins mentioned that uh, you have to have the right people on the bus and uh, in the right seats. And truly, we need kids driving their vehicles. We need kids taking responsibility for their own learning. And then the standards movement comes in and it says these are the things that you have to demonstrate uh, proficiency. And we say, fine, student voice and choice would be determining how they evidence that proficiency. And we have seen, as far as quantitative data, uh, a change in suspensions and detentions, a change in attendance, a change in uh, kids' participation in after-school activities. And this form, this uh, visual was put together to try to help people see that we were going to stay the course and focus specifically on learner-centered education from the kid out to the institution way over on the right-hand side. So this visual has helped us uh, articulate the priorities that we had in the state of Maine, and also uh, to convince our publics that we are going to stay the course. This is going to be the mantra. And learner centered education and assessments that mean something for kids and information systems that track individual learner growth, not just a, group, a class, but individual growth, uh, has already proven to be very exciting uh, at the local level. The next picture is, or slide is what we have done to try to help our communities uh, understand the process. And <clears throat> we use these. Um, well, six icons uh, in board retreats. We use them uh, as you know, agencies purchasing these books and distributing to all the superintendents and the principals in the state. We've used the authors uh, to traverse the state in presenting uh, their interpretation of what is in those pages because a lot of people will read the first chapter and then they'll skip through the rest of the book and they'll say, yeah, it's the same old stuff and bringing the author into town to speak about what the meaning is behind the words has been uh, eye-opening. Um, in fact, when you take a look at mindsets, mindset could have been interpreted as the tracking and the ability grouping that we had in the 50s and 60s when the fixed IQ was um, the mantra of the day where if you had 106 IQ, that was what you were going to die with and it didn't change. So we put you in the appropriate grouping, and in a way, that was a form of customizing. Um, the icon at the bottom of the page on the left is inevitable. It's a mass customized approach. And Dee McGarvey uh, used to be an administrator in Maine, still lives in Maine, and has uh, helped us immensely with new interpretation of reality. On the right-hand side, the uh, bottom right-hand corner is an article written by Richard Elmore about a new structured school of leadership which plants a seed of saying uh, the leadership skills that we acquired when we were going to school uh, have changed. Um, there was no course on how to deal with a contentious audience. There was no course on how to move a culture. There was no course on how to deal with uh, children who aren't learning. Uh, it was that fixed mindset that you were the leader and everybody else had to get on board. Um, Elmore comes through with a new interpretation that had really had uh, a disruptive, like just like technology, uh, reflective piece in a lot of administrators in the state of Maine, and I have used that extensively. Um, the next slide is something that I use um, <clears throat> with my audiences because um, a lot of administrators are left brain, they're very anal and sequential, and I'm trained as a civil engineer, and I am definitely on that left-hand side. And as an administrator, you try to do everything in your power to control the day, to make the classes longer, to meet teachers' and kids' needs. And everything was very specific. And on the right-hand side is a new world. And learning happens not only at school, and not only from a teacher, but from everybody, anytime, anywhere. And that goes worldwide. And the difference between the two paradigms has caused a lot of internal, intrinsic uh, thinking. Uh, to the point where people are considering that um, external credits and things that they do in Boy Scouts and 4-H and at the junior firefighters uh, meetings are really learning. 
and bringing it to school where a certified teacher says, I see the evidence of you met this standard, and I'm really proud of what you've done. This next slide helps people see the hierarchy of what we're really talking about. Uh, across the country, we've heard uh, the phraseology of uh, college and career ready for citizenship. I'd like to interpret that even beyond to say the product of our public education should be kids learning how to learn. If their career is going to change 8 to 15 times in their lifetime, um, they are going to be challenged with constant learning. So if, if that were the hierarchy, Maine already has in statute what we refer to as guiding principles habits of mind, 21st century skills, and in the latest legislation of what you'll hear me refer to as 1422, um, these skills cannot just be inferred from content. They have to be intentionally taught. They have to represent cross-curricular experiences and performance assessments also. So that uh, when you put together a, a gateway uh, assessment where you have multiple curriculums and kids, plural, work on a project at any time, anywhere, uh, extensions of the internet and collaborations amongst experts in the community, and they deliver a product the next day or the next week, um, they own that learning. It isn't something that I prescribe to them, you have to do a two-page paper. Um, this has been very motivating, and in, in some of the videos that you'll be seeing, uh, we've tried to capture that um, in the testimony from some of the kids. At the bottom of the page is the content, and we use the content as our tools to reach to the guiding principles and then to finally get to that hierarchy of learning how to learn. Keeping in mind, and we often forget this with our psychometricians, that we don't just test the cognitive recall. We have a psychomotor and an affective domain out there also, and through performance and through collaboration, we can achieve um, an assessment of all three domains in public education. What we've learned in the change process uh, is captured in the video, and I believe Jason is going to boot this one up. This is a, a collaboration of 11 districts. They call themselves the Western Maine Educational Co Consortium. And we have uh, learned the lesson of putting videos together because very few people understand the spoken word but when you see a video and you see a student and teacher testimony, it's really, really powerful. So Jason, if you'd run this uh, video for us. five years old, really instilling in the student's mind that this is their education. The other ones who benefit from them. Simplify, simplify, simplify. Uh, use cognitive testimonial, concrete examples. So what was happening in this room was really the, the magic and action of the collaboration between these systems. 
power in the spring is in the collaboration. It's in the conversation. I think that change does happen in the conversation. Uh, and that's what we think that would be going on. So we're back on. And one of our challenges was in constructing rubrics that kids and parents would understand. And this is a chart that uh, our cohort for customized learning, which is a collaboration of 29 districts working together and supporting one another, had put together. Um, at the bottom of the page, if you look at that pink section on retrieval and comprehension, that is the industrial model. You could get a 100 and an A-plus average if you could regurgitate facts, figures, names, dates, and places. When a 3 would be the green section in analysis and knowledge utilization would be a 4, and then the next slide, we broke that down into a hierarchy of what represents a 4 rubric to help teachers design an assessment and a rubric for a learning target so that kids would understand it and also for the parents to understand it too. And once this chart was produced and distributed across various districts, uh, you can see the RSU2 main cohort for customized learning. Um, a sense of comprehension and an and exhale of confidence uh, generated throughout many, many of these districts. So the angst was removed. This is the beginning. This slide here will help us uh, take a look at what we refer to as a proficiency-based diploma. Uh, in the last session, last spring's legislative session, we passed a legislative document referred to as 1422 that requires a standards-based curriculum and a proficiency-based diploma by 2018. So therefore, in the fall of 14, we have to let the freshmen know that their diploma will be based on a proficiency of every standard in every curriculum area, not an averaging of deficits with strengths and hiding what you don't know. And the analogy I give is suppose you had a four standard report and you got a 90, a 90, a 90, and a 10. That the average is a 70 and in the old world we'd move on, but in the standards in the proficiency based world, we say you get an incomplete until you make that up to an acceptable grade. So what we have for graduation here in this uh, visual is that the cross-curricular skills are guiding principles are mandatory for uh, a diploma and also the standards, the rather vague, broad, aggregate size uh, learning goal uh, has to be demonstrated. What happens in the classroom with performance indicators and the feedback and the units and the objectives is still a teacher decision. They can uh, assess and come up with a grade uh, by trends, or they can figure out a grade uh, on various competencies, but it's still up to the local. So we're using the rubric for a fidelity and an interpretation of what happens in the, in the local district. We're still a very local control state, but we came up with an excuse for everybody to say, blame the state. By 2018, we're going to need to demonstrate a proficiency in all the standards before we can award a diploma. John, this is Don. So we came up Don, with I'm these giving you the five minutes. Yep. Five minutes? Thank you. Thank you. We came up with uh, some help with Nellie May and, and working to create these videos. We now have a video library of uh, 10, and soon you'll see at the bottom of the page we're going to do one more middle school and then do the commissioner. So here's my last video, and Jason, if you'd run that, I think this runs just uh, two minutes and 18 seconds.
which means that students had voice and choice. They were allowed to work on any measurement topic that they could help on. A lot of people work the activities to make up writing, math, reading. Sometimes one of the teachers will give you a sheet of stuff that you need that. And you can take them over to somewhere and go through the process and teach them. That happens a lot. Voice and choice for all of us is such a powerful thing. If we aren't feeling like we're in a box and we're told exactly what we need to do and it's best for the way, they're able to feel like they're ridiculous, which they are, and, and they know that we're here with them and that um, it's our job to, you know, change the way we teach in order to I feel like I don't have a day, and I feel like I did the best I could for every child. Whereas before, when I'm teaching a traditional model, I go home and I think, oh man, I didn't get this, this, and this. And I, didn't, I know that he was struggling in the back of the room, and I couldn't help him today. And I don't feel that anymore. I feel like, you know, every second of our classroom day is spent helping kids at their level. This is who I am now. This is the way that I teach. In the last slide, next steps for the state of Maine. Uh, we have created a glossary so that when we speak to each other, we will know what we're talking about. And uh, in, on June 23rd, we will uh, do a soft launch of a technical assistance plan to help every individual district move in this direction. Uh, we have an official launch of July 1st and will include many, many resources uh, so that the Department of Education can reorganize itself to have uh, a response to intervention to every school administrative unit in our state. Second bullet is our website for the Center for Best Practices. We have stakeholder groups and practitioner groups and uh, come in and reviewed our plans before we launch it. We're trying to align everything that we're doing and review our statutes to make sure they are aligned. But I have to caution everyone. Policy, practice, and public will is never over. You are going to constantly be challenged by those things. And you have to stay vigilant. And the best way to um, deal with that is to have a lot of people share that leadership role instead of just a few. This is just an example of the electronic bullets that we're putting together for the technical assistance plan. It addresses uh, policy, practice, and public will. Also, will include supports and in, in our partners in this whole process, as well as a roadmap on how to go ahead. <coughs> the uh, reflective pieces that I have is that student voice and choice is very, very powerful. And that's what motivates kids to come to school, changes their behavior. Um, the SA, E, the, school, the uh, state educational agency has to realign itself to be able to intervene at the local levels. And leadership skills have to be addressed because this process is very complex. You have to be patient with yourself and forgive yourself and start over again and move it forward. And if there were challenges, it would be second order change. Uh, as the teacher at the James Bean School said, this is who I am now. I have made the change. It is not a thing. It is a way of doing my work and my profession. So with that, I'll turn it back uh, to those. Oh, one more comment, and that's about higher ed. Uh, we have an advisory group with higher ed made up of uh, high school guidance counselors and college admissions directors. And we have a template for a, a standards-based, learner-centered transcript. And we will be launching that in June. And then we're trying to align it with an electronic version so that all the schools in New England can receive an, uh, a college application from students in Maine that will be separate. We, we will separate the academics from the behaviors and the guiding principal skills. Because the return on investment that a college admissions director makes is about an emotional quotient and the perseverance and the persistence that kids come to their campus. So with that, uh, we have also gathered 49 pledges from colleges throughout our six state region. And uh, they not only will hold harmless, but they prefer a standards-based learner-centered transcript to review. 
So with that, I'll turn it back to Chris and Susan for any questions that may be posed. Great. That's wonderful, Don. And you did it all. Um, so we do have one question right now, and I think this also relates to Jason's comments about Iowa, the challenge of making sense of what is a competency, what is a standard. Um, and so the question is, is there any effort to standardize the taxonomy around competency education? The glossary is useful. But I'm thinking that the tools, policies, and mindsets, um, if we had a rigorously standardized taxonomy, then electronic tools, policy documents, and I can't read the rest of the question. Oops, I'm going to lose it. But um, you'd be able to uh, have a, an electronic um, a repository. And so I think the question for you is because you have a, a, a lot of grassroots approaches, how do you make sure that what the um, competencies are and the le measurable learning targets are in Maine are uh, meaningful across districts? And is there any problem about people developing different types? Well, in 1997, Maine legislature adopted the Maine learning results, and it was revised in 07, and we have adopted the Common Core, and we're looking to adopt the next-gen science standards. So we are aligned with the national initiatives, but we are very uh, uh, clear in we are looking at standards. We're not looking at every measurement topic going. Uh, we still are embracing local control, and we're leaving it up to the local to determine um, when a proficiency is met. So we are using the word proficiency in content standards, and we're using the word proficiency in meeting a level of quality for our guiding principles. So uh, proficiency would, would reference a level of quality of content and also a level of quality of uh, cross-curricular skills. What are we doing? We are uh, working with the Center for Collaborative Education to come up with performance assessments with exemplars, creating a bank of resources. Uh, we're collaborating with New Hampshire on this initiative so that uh, each of the districts can resource a bank of resources, a bank of performance assessments to see if their students' quality or exemplars match the exemplars that we have in the bank. And that's the only uh, process that we have. Uh, we're not going to do Big Brother and go into districts and say, uh, your A isn't the same as my A. Your 4 is different than my 4. We don't have the capacity to that, and we still have a local control governed state. Great. Thank you so much, Don. So I think we're so close out of time. Um, Susan, do you want to jump in there and talk about the aligning the policy infrastructure? Yes, there's one last question from Jesse. Any challenges around federal accountability, which is a perfect lead-in? Um, and the answer is yes. So at, at INACL, on our policy efforts at the federal level and at the state level, we are really looking at, um, with our partners across Competency Works, um, getting very strong in our advocacy for aligning the policy infrastructure and thinking about competency-based education, this is truly student-centered, and so we really need the policy infrastructure to be looking at it from a student-centered point of view, designing from the ground up, rethinking, I would say, the regime, the regime of systems of assessments. If I think about Don's um, slides and talking about required for graduation and then those different activities, I was placing a another lens on that that said required for accountability um, and, and what that might look like. Um, so we're deeply engaged right now in thinking about the implications for um, rethinking accountability. Um, the Hill is taking on ESEA reauthorization, quite frankly, um, this week and starting again. We'll see where it goes. But this is a very important time to be having conversations around goal, general broad goals that would support competency-based education. Um, and another key piece, and we just wrote a paper and have another webinar that's archived on re-engineering your IT systems at the state level and at the district level to support competency-based education. This is really key. And of course, um, aligning federal policy, state policy, 
and the local policy to support competency education. So those are the those are the big ideas. We will be um, putting out some guidelines around federal policy and recommendations. We're getting asked on Capitol Hill and with the U.S. Department of Education right now to work on submitting recommendations. And so those of you that are interested in federal and state policy, um, we'd love to collaborate with you and share the work that we're doing. And we'll be sharing that out on Competency Works. And we're right at 4 o'clock, so I'll turn it back over to you to close, Chris. So Chris, I can't hear you. I'm not sure if your mic is on. It was, but thank you. Um, uh, so first of all, thank you to Don and Jason for your leadership and for everything that you have um, done for our country, for kids, and for sharing it with other people. We really appreciate it deeply. Um, upcoming, we're going to start working on an issue brief on grading. Any thoughts, ideas? Love to hear about them. And other organizations are putting on a number of different webinars and um, summer institutes this summer that you can read about here. And they're also available on Competency Works. And as always, we are looking for contributing authors. It makes a huge difference if everybody would write one blog post a year about what you learned that year and shared it with others. We would um, be able to have actually the best way to help the next person learn how to do competency education in a, work, in a way that really strives for equity and excellence. So thank you all, and have a lovely afternoon.